Um, all right, let's let's have a uh, let's have a word of prayer and and we'll begin. Father, thank you for being with us tonight. For all my brothers and sisters watching online and here with me, I'm grateful. Um, so, Father, just give us your spirit so that whether we're watching right here near the church or up in Virginia or Georgia or Utah or Kentucky, wherever folks may be. Father, just be with them and bless them and um, open up your your word to us, Father. Give us, give us your word. Um, give us your spirit so that you may teach us and we hear what it is you need us to hear. And as we pray later, Father, just search our hearts, Lord. You know our needs. We thank you, Father, for helping us to pray. So be with us, Lord, tonight. We are grateful. In Christ's name, amen. All right. So tonight, uh, we're going to try to finish up chapter 4. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Jim, Jimmy's, Jimmy's watching. Uh, the Reardons are watching. Uh, Jane and Dave are watching. So we're glad you guys are all there. <coughs> Verses 11 through through 17 tonight. We're going to start uh, with verses 11 and 12. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and one judge one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? I just wish James would just be more plain spoken. <laughs> so he shifts gears here a little bit, um, but he's, he's staying with a general theme, uh, and that is the issue of pride and how it affects, negatively affects, our, our life in the kingdom, our life in the church. He's still talking about the sin of pride. In the previous verses, he was talking about how our pride gets in the way of our relationship with the Father. Here, he begins speaking by how our pride gets in the way of our relationship with one another and causes disruption in the church. Uh, the Greek word uh, that he, he uses here, uh, your Greek word for the day, uh, actually it's not, i throw another one at you later, uh, is katalaline. Sounds very poetic, but it means to slander someone who is not there to defend themselves. And this, he says, is just pride. When we tear someone down behind their backs, it's almost always to either bring them down so that we look better, we are built up, we are made to be more important, or at least we're pulling them down to our poor level. Um, what is it that mis misery loves? Company. Company. And the last thing a bunch of miserable people want is somebody who's happy. Um, and so uh, the miserable people tend to want to try to tear down that, that one uh, to uh, pull them down to their, their level. Um, uh, some of you have had the chance to, to meet uh, our, our daughter. Uh, some of you are friends with her on, on Facebook. And the question I get asked when I'm around her coworkers and so forth is, is she really always this happy? And the answer is yes. Uh, when she was five years old, she woke up happy. Uh, she's never woken up grumpy a day in her life, as far as I know. Uh, and yes, she is always that positive. And yes, she is always that upbeat and happy and so forth. And she drives some people crazy that way. Um, and, and so she knows that from time to time in different environments that people will talk about her behind her back. Surely she's got to be fake. Surely she can't really be all this. She was... Uh, as, as some of you know, she was, she was up for uh, uh, State Teacher of the Year in Georgia a year or so ago. And uh, her mother, wise woman that she is, tried to say, 
Honey, you're up in North Georgia, you're up in the greater Atlanta area. It's been four years since anybody from South Georgia won. This is all political at this level. Um, you know, that's what's going to happen. And that is what happened. Um, but later, Rebecca got a chance to talk to some of the people who made the decision and ask, um, you know, what, uh, what was it that I needed to improve on? Tell me how I can do better. And they said, oh, nothing. She, she said, well, if there's nothing I can improve on, uh, and she kind of left the question hanging out there, and they said, well, frankly, we just didn't think that you, you know, could really do all the stuff that you did. Oh, what? Um, that didn't set real well, because, you know, honestly, all they had to do was call her principal or uh, the other people who work with her to find out, yes, all of that stuff that was there on her resume, yeah, she did do all of that, and she did it all with a smile. Um, and then that person quit the state and left. Um, you know, it's, it's pride, and it happens at work, it happens sometimes in our families, it happens at church, uh, and, and James is saying, look, it may happen out there in the world, but there is absolutely no place for it in the church. There is no place in the church for that kind of talk or behavior toward a brother or sister. And remember, as we were talking about James early on, introducing James, James was the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. Well, the church in Jerusalem. And, uh, uh, and James was a good Jew. James was in the temple at all the right times. And uh, James, if you know, we talk about Messianic Jews today, James, James was the poster child for the very first generation of Messianic Jews. Uh, and so his mind immediately would go to the Psalms, Psalm 50, verse 20. You sit and speak against your own brother. You slander your own mother's son. Psalm 101, the beginning of verse 5. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy, says the Lord. Uh, Paul included slander in his list of the sins of the pagans in Romans 1.30. Paul was saying, look, there's a definite division between the pagans and us. And here's all the things that the pagans do. They're, this is why they're so pagany. And one of the things is slander. They constantly slander each other all the time. Um, honestly, there are not a lot of sins that the Bible so severely condemns as the Bible condemns slander, backbiting, gossiping behind people's backs, tearing people down behind their back. And James says that, that the reason the Bible does this is, is two reasons. One, Jesus himself said it's one of the two great commandments from Leviticus 19.18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, clearly... You are not loving your neighbor as yourself when you're maliciously tearing him or her down, right? Um, if, we're, if we're just going to throw rocks at our neighbor, that's not loving our neighbor. So we are denying what's called the royal law, you know, the, one of the two great commandments, Jesus said. And so as we, as we do that, we're just brushing aside the law as being unimportant, you know, or that law is just too small to pertain to someone as wonderful as, as I am or as you are. You know, I, I am above the law. I don't have to worry about a law like that. I, you know, me, me and God are okay, so if I talk about what a rotten, lousy person you are, it's, that's all right because, well, you know, I'm better than you. Um, so... You're making yourself, James says, a judge of the law, the very law of God itself. And so when you do that, you're condemning yourself. And he said, secondly, then, if you're going to condemn the law of God, you're putting yourself in God's shoes. And isn't that what we do all the time anyway? What, what was it the serpent said to Eve? Well, the reason God doesn't want you eating of the tree of knowledge is that 
you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Uh, and we've been wanting to play God ever since. Um, so we put ourselves in God's shoes. And James says, no, there is only one judge. There's only one lawgiver. There's only one God, and it's not you. <laughs> only God and God alone can judge. So with a single slanderous line towards our brother or our sister, we neither love our neighbor or love God. Well, so then, uh, basically having made you feel good about yourself, see, <clears throat> I got to tell you folks, as a preacher, the idea when I hear, you know, like, you, you put a bunch of people in a, uh, a room together and you say, you know, what do you, what, do you, what do you hope to get out of a worship service? And you hear people say things like, well, I just want to feel good about things when I leave. Maybe that's the exact opposite of what needs to happen. Uh, you know, if the preacher is there to help you feel good about yourself, uh, then maybe he's not doing his job. Um, if, if you, uh, since James is picking on slandering, if, if you're one of those people that is constantly slandering other people just to tear them down to make you look better, maybe the worst thing that could happen is that you feel good when you walk out of church. Verse 13. So come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city. And spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. And all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is a sin. So James is still attacking our pride, but he, he shifts a little bit from our interpersonal relationships to where pride has, has made a home right here in our heart. This is where pride lives warm and safe, happy. Pride tends to be the source of our pronoun problem. I've often said the biggest problem Christians often have, or people in general have, is a pronoun problem. We say, I will do this. Or look at what I have done. Pointing to ourselves. Um, years ago, uh, after a sparkling career as a, uh, a grocery bagger for Winn-Dixie. I, I pushed on to Stock Boy at a shoe store, really working my way up in the business world. And, and one of the guys I worked with, one of the salesmen, um, he was the kind of guy who, who could sell anything to anybody. And, and I know that somewhere today he's no doubt working uh, in a, uh, either used cars or a CBD plant. And, um, uh, and he had a, a song that he would sing. And, and it was funny because we knew that he partially meant it. Um, it it's, a, it's a song that uh, he, he twisted a little bit. The original song was, You're Just Too Good to Be True. Can't Take My Eyes Off of You, right? Lovely little Valentine's Day love song. He turned it around to say, I'm just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off of me. Hey, oh, I'd be like heaven to touch. Yes, so go ahead, okay. And all of us would like, I don't know whether to cry or, you know. The difference, and again, what made it funny when he did it, is that he at least said it and kind of made it a joke, but there's so many people who live it, they just don't say it. I will do this, look what I have done. 
There was a fellow who was um, president of the Georgia Baptist Convention a number of years ago when we were there, and he made some statement in the newspaper that caused a lot of uh, attention for about 10 minutes. And I was at a uh, pastor's meeting the next day, and one of them said, what do you mean by that? Somebody said, I don't know, but it didn't sound right. And the other fellow said, well, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to throw stones or anything. I, I want to find out what he meant. He said, well, why don't you call him? He said, yeah, that's what I'll do. So the next week we come back and we're all anxious to hear how that went. And he's, and we said, so did you, did you call him? He goes, yeah, I did. He said, how'd it go? He said, not good. He said, well, why is that? He said, well, I, I called and I got his, his personal secretary on the phone. And she told me that I, would not, I wasn't allowed to talk to him. We said, what do you mean you weren't allowed to talk to him? She, and he said, well, I told her that I was another Baptist pastor here in the state. And, and uh, you know, from one brother to another, I just wanted to get on the phone with him for a few minutes. And she told me no. Well, why? And she said, well, frankly, he doesn't have time for the likes of you. I'm just too good to be true. My grandmother loves my preaching. Yes, she does. She tells me all the time I'm the best preacher she's ever heard. And she's old, so that's a lot. The, the way that our pride just, just you know, it's, it's that person that, that pushes their way to the front of the line because they want me to be up there. Uh, the Jews were, were great commercial traders of the ancient world. They, they, they were very, very good at, uh, at doing that, and partly because they learned it. Uh, if you look at a map, Israel is right in the middle of the trade routes from uh, east to west, and they learned commercial trade, and they were very good at it. They got good at it, and so whenever the Romans would build a city, the Jews were often invited to come to be citizens of the new city. Philippi, for instance, would be a Roman city that the Romans just built um, and invited the Jews to come. That's why there was a synagogue there. Um, they would offer instant citizenship in the city because they knew that by doing so, the Jews would bring money and commerce to the city. So it was not uncommon for a Jew in Philippi or Jerusalem or anywhere around the Roman Empire to say, well, I'm going to go to this city or that city, and I'm going to do business here, and I'm going to be here for a year and make a profit. But what's the old saying? Man proposes, but God disposes. Uh, remember in the, the book of Acts, that man Saul, he had a plan. He was going to go to Damascus. He had business to take care of in Damascus. But God had other plans. That same man years later had plans to go into Bithynia. If you get your Bibles out and open the maps in the back as you're looking at the little arrows of Paul's second missionary journey, he's going straight from south to north up through Turkey, and he wants to go all the way up to the Black Sea. And one of those things that just drives me crazy all the scripture says was, and the Holy Spirit prevented him. What did the Holy Spirit do? How did the Holy Spirit do that? Did, I mean, what did the, how did that happen? And so he wanted to, when that didn't work, then he wanted to shift just a little bit, and the Spirit of Jesus said no. And so if you look at the little arrows on the map of the second missionary journey, Paul goes up to here and is stopped. He's got plans. He's, he's got stuff to do over there. And the little arrow makes a 90 degree left turn towards the west. And he heads straight towards the coast. And he sits there. It's that time where C.S. Lewis says, this is the shadow lands. It's neither light nor dark. It's neither cold nor hot. It's just that middle time. Um, we were talking about Henry Blackaby earlier. Uh, Henry says there are times where God will put you on the shelf. And he said, but don't think that God's just forgotten you up there. God is going to absolutely wear you out uh, while he has you on the shelf. 
waiting for him to take you down and plug you in where he needs you. Um, and so if you look then at that map in the back of your Bible, all the way up north, south and north in Turkey, big left turn, all the way to the coast, heading west, and then there's another big right turn heading back north towards Macedonia, towards Philippi. Man may propose, but God is going to dispose because God has other plans. Proverbs 27.1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what the day may bring forth. Who are you? James is asking. I love that. Who do you think you are to say that you're going to do anything tomorrow on your own? No. But James makes the point that the uncertainty of life is no reason for fear or inaction. Verse 15 says, Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. Um, yeah, life's uncertain. Um, you know, um, I uh, all those years we lived in Atlanta, and I, that's kind of funny. We've got a couple of folks here who've got kids in college in North Georgia or at Auburn, and to get to Auburn from here, you've got to go to Atlanta and hang a left. And, um, <laughs> you know, the first time uh, one family took their kids up to North Georgia to go to college, they came back and said, how did you live for 30 years in that Atlanta traffic? And, well, the short answer is you know when to avoid it. <laughs> you just don't get in it. You learn the little side roads, the back roads, that are actually just as fast as getting on the express lanes. But, you know, I remember sitting there one day at a traffic light on my little side road, and uh, this girl comes on the radio, and with this perfect monotone voice, she's giving the traffic report. And there's an accident with fatality on this interstate, and there's another accident with multiple fatalities on that interstate, and there's another accident with multiple fatalities on this interstate. And I'm thinking, here's about 10 people who just got up on a regular day to go to work, and they never made it to work. They either made it to heaven or hell. And if you dwell on that, it would be easy to never want to go outside at all. Um, you know, if think back just a couple of years ago, when basically what the CDC and everybody else was saying, if you leave your house to go to the grocery store, you're going to die. <clears throat> and there are people still today who are scared to death to go outside because they might catch COVID or the flu or some other horrible disease that, you know, we don't even have a name for you. And James is saying, no, 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 no. You, 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 just, you just trust God. You just put, put your trust in, in God. Life's uncertainty is not the reason for us to hide or be paralyzed by fear. No, it's the reason for our complete dependence and trust in God. That's, that's what life's uncertainty is for. Where do you put your trust? Do you put your trust in the other drivers out on the interstate? Or do you put your trust in God? Do you put your trust in all of the geniuses on Wall Street? Or do you put your trust in God? Do you put your trust in who's ever sitting in the White House? Or do you put your trust in God? This is what James is saying. Uh, James agrees with Paul, where Paul tells the church in Corinth, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. If the Lord wills. I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. As followers of Christ, we should never be afraid to go into the future paralyzed and unable to move forward. Rather, we should seek God's plan for us and move forward, placing all of our plans in his hands and always be willing to adjust our lives as his plans for us change. Paul 
wanted to go all the way to the Black Sea. God's plans for Paul changed this way. And so Paul had to adjust. Moses was very happy being a shepherd. He had no intention of going back to Egypt. He wasn't real popular there in the first place. Um, no, he, he didn't, didn't have any plan of doing that at all. But God had another plan for him. Um, Gideon, perfectly happy hiding from the Midianites. Not really interested in leading an army, but God had another plan for him. When God has a plan for our life, regardless of where we are in life, again, going back to Andrew Blackaby, we, we, we have to adjust our lives to what it is that we know God wants us to be able to do. Um, the direction he wants us to go in, the, the action he wants us to take, and he says, the one who's unwilling to do this then is guilty of arrogance and boasting. I don't want to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. Or I'm going to go here and I'm going to go there. And if God doesn't like it, well, God can just deal with it. I'll get back with him later. And the word James uses is alonzania. And it's funny because it's the word that uh, the Greeks would use for a snake oil salesman. Somebody that promises all kinds of things he really can't deliver on. Um, you know, if you say, yes, dear, dear friend, I'm sitting here in Jerusalem. I've got uh, uh, 8,000 gallons of olive oil to bring to you in Rome. I will absolutely, positively be there in three months. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, undersea archaeologists in uh, the Mediterranean who will tell you that they didn't all make it. <laughs> uh, you know, that you just can't, you just can't promise this. Uh, trivia question. Anybody know the name of the guy that wrote Peter Pan? Sir James Barry wrote Peter Pan. Neat guy, interesting guy. That's your homework assignment, Jill. Uh, find out all you can about Sir James Barry. The older he got, he said, he never made long-range plans. He said, I never make plans more than just for a couple of days. <laughs> he said, don't invite me to dinner at your house next month. I will not say yes. Uh, you know, I, I just, you know, don't ever plan long-term because you never know. Uh, you know, where God's going to take you, what God's going to do, what life's going to throw at you. Um, and so the people who guarantee that they're going to go here, like James's example, I'm going to go here and I'm going to work there for a year. Well, no, you can promise, but there's nothing really certain that you're going to be able to deliver on. So James ends with a warning. Now that you know the right thing to do, to continue to live self-confidently rather than God-confidently, rather than putting your confidence, your faith, your trust in God, is in fact then a sin. Once you know the good that you should do, that God expects you to do, once ignorance of what God's requirements are isn't an excuse anymore, then not to do it, is a sin. And it's a sin because in this case, as he's talking about you making your own plans and you bragging about what you're going to do and not going to do, it's a sin because you're living as if the future, your future, was in your hands and not God's. Once again, putting ourselves in God's shoes, making ourselves to be the God of our own lives. Uh, that's that's where the sin really comes in. Um, it's a hard thing for us. Uh, years ago, uh, I, uh, I spoke uh, at a lady's funeral, and her son came up to me, and I didn't really know him, and he said, uh, you did good. And I said, thank you. And he said, no, I, I'm a professional speaker. Uh, I get... Uh, $10,000 per speaking engagement. And uh, 
Uh, you're good. You're very good. Thank you. Go away. And um, uh, he said, would you be willing to come and speak at a leadership conference that I'm putting on? I don't know. Maybe. He goes, I'll pay you. All right, I'll be there. Um, but the struggle for me was what? If you, I'm speaking to a bunch of believers in Jesus Christ about what Christian leadership is, it is a whole other animal than what he was talking about. I was like the third or fourth person who was supposed to speak. And after I heard the other three, I'm thinking, there go my notes. <laughs> you know, because if I'm talking to a bunch of Christian leaders, I'm talking to them about this, about what James is talking about. Look, it isn't about your plans. It's not about your five-year plan for your church or your 10-year plan for your church. It's getting on your knees and asking God what is his plan and then finding that and, 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 and doing that. A guy that owns five car dealerships in Dallas, Texas, who's not a Christian, has no understanding of what I'm talking about at that point. Um, if he is a Christian, then we can talk some, because it does apply to your business just as much as it applies to your church. But I'm thinking, yeah, I'm looking at most of these people out of that audience. Yeah, there's not a lot of Christians here. This is a one-time deal. I just get that feeling. And it was. Um, how we live our life as believers in Jesus Christ is different than how the world leads. It's just different because we know what Christ requires. And if we don't do it, that is a sin. If we know it and we refuse to do it, then that's a sin. So we are going to do it, and that makes us very, very different. When we were studying 1 John, remember John said it should be obvious who in a room is saved and who is not, simply by how they live their lives out. And um, uh, so, you know, this is the kind of thing that, uh, uh, that, that James is, is trying to help the church to understand. How you lived in the world where you were on your own, where you were making decisions for yourself, that life is over now that you've accepted Christ as your Savior. Now that you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you pick up your cross and follow Him. Um, uh, I've mentioned before I, I'm a fan of the uh, series uh, that's now in its third season called The Chosen. Um, the episode where Nicodemus comes to Mary uh, asking for that late night meeting with, with Jesus, and he's insistent. And she says, I follow him and not the other way around. Um, you know, that's a good word. I, I follow him. He doesn't follow me. I follow Jesus and not the other way around. And this is what James is saying. Um, you know, again, the, uh, one of the biggest heresies uh, of the last 30 years is the bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot. God is not my co-pilot, because that implies that I'm the pilot. Uh, no, God is the pilot. Uh, I'm probably not even the co-pilot. Definitely not the navigator. Uh, you know, at, at best, the uh, flight attendant just helping people know where to put their luggage. Um, so, okay, questions? Answers? Anybody unhappy? Okay. What did you speak on with that group? I really did shove my notes aside. I'm going, I can't, yeah, I can't do that. Uh, you know, basically, I, I, what, what would, you know me, what, what would you guess that I did? Some of your stories. Are Bingo. Yes, I sat, I threw my notes <laughs> out and said I need to come up with one good story that, that, they, could, uh, that they could connect to, and that's, that's what I did. And, uh, and one or two. No, just one, one long one. one I, I, you know, I was on and off in about 10 minutes. And, uh, but you know what? Um, because I didn't take 45 minutes, all of them are going, hey, that was great. Yeah, that was really good. Wow. 
best speaker of the day he said everything you needed to say in 10 minutes sign him up and the and the guy that that asked me to speak was a little you know on the one hand everybody's going yeah he was great and, and he's thinking yeah, i'm paying him all this money for 10 minutes you know but anyhow um you know it's it's uh it's how you how you speak to a group of believers and how you speak to a group of non-believers is two different things uh, you know, if you think about it, go back and look at what Paul did in his speech uh, in Athens, Greece, not Georgia, um, where he's speaking to the powers that be on Mars Hill. He doesn't quote the Bible. Yeah, he, he quotes one of their poets, and he says, did not your own poets say, you know, um, and, and tries to use their own language to be able to help them understand. Um, was it wildly successful? Did all of them get saved? Nope. But enough did that God could use um, to be able to start a church there um, and to be able to, uh, to move forward. The, the people that needed to get saved got saved, um, and God was able to use them. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, Lord, maybe out of all of that, the, the biggest statement James makes is that when you know, when you know what it is that you were to do, when you know the right thing and you do not do it, that is a sin. To other people, it may not be a sin. And why are you worrying about it? Well, because they don't know what I know. You've given me an insight and an understanding and I know that if I don't follow what it is that you want me to do, it's a sin. And so I can't do option number two. Just not, not going to work. And so, Father, thank you for that. Thank you for constantly reminding us how dangerous our pride can be. How subtle it can sneak out and poison our lives and the relationships that we have with others and with you. And so thank you, Father, for the word of James as he speaks to us, for the way that you use him to speak to our hearts. Be with us, Lord, as we pray. In Christ's name, amen.